All right, so uh, my name is Lucas Pruitt. I am going into my junior year at UNC in the Video Frodo VizCom program. Um, I don't know if anyone's a freshman or taking 180 next year, but depending on how uh, the schedules, what, what happens with the schedules and COVID, uh, I might be TAing for that. So it'd be cool to meet you guys if you're doing 180 next year or next semester. Um, and uh, today I'm going to be talking about filming basics uh, for, it's mostly focused on documentary video, and I don't know if anyone saw the camera basics with Ari, Ari um, but some of it might overlap a little bit. I might repeat some of what he says, but it's all uh, what I've felt like was the most important stuff in my experience. Um, I've done video for nearly my whole life. Uh, I started doing video and photo stuff when I was eight years old. Um, and this is just some of the stuff I've learned and a lot of it's came from uh, the first two years at UNC as well. All right. So I thought we'd start with uh, gear setups. And since this is filming basics, I'm mostly gonna be focusing on the visual side. Um, we already had an audio lecture. So uh, the first, the first part of my gear setups uh, section is going to be about lenses. And I narrowed it down to what I think are the three, uh, or, well, these are all pretty widely accepted to be the three types of lenses you might need. And um, the first one I would say is to have a wide angle. The second one is to have a fast mid range prime. Um, I don't know if, or I know Ari talked about what fast means. Uh, it basically means the aperture opens wider, and so it'd be better in low light. And then, um, and then I have a telephoto lens, and as a special add-on, I put ND filters with a star next to it. It won't go. Hold on, I'm having trouble changing slides. Okay, there we go. All right, so first is wide angle. And I put that wide angles are good for establishing shots, um, which are, can be scene setters. They expand perspective and they exaggerate depth. So wide angles are typically anything like 28 millimeters and below, or, or 35 millimeters and below, depending on who you ask. Um, this is shot with an 18 um, millimeter and I shoot on an APS-C camera. So it has a bit of a crop and I think it, it, at, it goes to about a 27 and a half millimeter. So this is 18 millimeters on my camera, but it's equivalent to 27 and a half on a full frame sensor. So the first, the first thing I put was establishing shots. Um, this is an example of a screenshot from a film I did. Um, it's actually about myself. It was for the Hearst Awards video competition uh, a few months ago. And I put that they're good for establishing shots because um, they can capture, obviously, they're a wide, a wide angle lens, so they capture a whole scene. If you back, and you can really back up and capture everything that's happening uh, in one shot. And so establishing shots are important because they help give context for the scene. And like, it's important to know and let your audience know, let the viewer know what you're filming and kind of where you're at. They, uh, it'll make more sense to them. And it also opens some doors for you to move into close-up shots without them being confused. If you go straight to a close-up shot of a scene and like a close-up shot of action, then they might get a little confused on like where you're at and where everyone is placed in the scene and where the area around you is and what environment you're in. So, the, so establishing shots are really important for setting the scene. The next, this is from uh, just not really a film, it was just a little video I made about uh, a camping trip I went on a few months ago. And uh, this was uh, also shot at 18 millimeters or 27 and a half about millimeter equivalent. And I put the, I put this shot in here because I liked it because it's a good example of a medium uh, shot with a wide angle lens. And I thought that 
this one went well with what I said, the bullet point I said about expanding perspective, um, because I thought it was really interesting how much information I can include in this shot. I have my friend here in the foreground, and then I also have a lot of context around him. Uh, so you can see the mountains in the background, and you can see he has his pack beside him, and, and you know he's taking a rest. And uh, I thought this was really good because it shows like how effective wide angles can be for even whenever you're at a medium range and you're not backed up all the way out, um, they can still give a lot of context to where what kind of scene you're in and like what's happening. And this uh, I put in here because I said uh, for my last bullet point that it exaggerates depth. And exaggerating depth is like, not as much practical as I think it is just cool and it makes it it makes your film more visual. This obviously isn't the best shot. I'm a little overexposed here and the lighting's not great. It's not even fully sharp, but I thought it did a really good job of showing how a wide angle exaggerates depth. It's also shot at 18 millimeters. And so I thought this was a cool shot because it almost felt 3D to me especially when you watch it. I, I didn't want to play it because you wouldn't get the same effect over Zoom, but especially whenever you're watching it cut with everything else, it feels like the shovel's coming out at you in the scene. And like, even though this is like, what, like two feet from my feet, um, this is me here. This is the shovel head is like two feet from my feet. It looks like it's a lot further and it kind of exaggerates the, the depth between uh, me and the shovel head. And I just thought it looked cool. Um, and I think uh, one of the good, a good filmmaker that came out of UNC a couple years, or last year, I guess he graduated uh, when I was a freshman, is uh, Rob Gorley. And he told me that uh, if he had to give a tip for cinematography, it would be to get wide and close. So shoot on a wide angle lens and get as close as you can to uh, like the action or whatever detail you're trying to film. And I thought this was a good example of like how that can look really cool uh, whenever you use it in your video. All right, so the fast mid-range prime. Uh, this is one of the most fun lenses. This is the Sigma 30 millimeter um, F1.4. And uh, so it's a 45 millimeter equivalent, uh, again, because I shoot on an APS-C camera um, with a crop sensor. And so I put some of the benefits of this is that they're great in low light because of that f1.4 aperture. I know Ari talked about how the, the opening in the lens uh, lets a lot more light in. They're super sharp. Uh, typically, it's a lot, it's a lot easy for, easier for camera, camera manufacturers to make a really nice sharp uh, prime lens than it is a zoom lens because there's uh, less, in the, less to the lens. Um, they're artsy. Uh, you can get really cool effects with them. I'll show you that uh, in another slide. They're versatile and deep and they get good detail shots. Uh, so for versatility, I thought this was uh, really interesting because I had, before I had a good wide angle lens, I, I had like a, a kit lens and I kind of avoided using it just because the footage I got from it didn't look that great. And I shot pretty much everything on this camera or on this one lens for like almost a year. I could get pretty much everything I needed with this. And I had an 85 millimeter too, but it was mostly just this lens. Um, and it's such a versatile focal length. I would say try to get somewhere in the, if you're gonna get a fast prime or use a fast prime, I would say try and get like 35 to 50 millimeters would be the first one I did because it's just such a useful range because uh, you can get like semi wide and you can get semi close as well with the same lens. So here's an example of a detail shot and a low light shot that I got with uh, my, my 30 millimeter one four. And so I just thought this was a cool lens. If I, if I was using my wide angle lens or a slower aperture lens, I wouldn't have been able to get a an image like this. This is a painter. I don't, you can tell a lot better in the actual moving video, but he's uh, painting in this part. Of it. This is the paintbrush here and his glasses that I got a shot of. 
here's an example, another example of how good they can be in low light. It was pretty much pitch black out here, like, or, or not pitch black, but it, the sun had set and it was darker than it looks in this image uh, to my eyes. Like I probably couldn't see as much detail with my eyes as I could with this image. And, uh, you know, I had to boost my ISO a little bit, but it was still really impressive what you're able to do with these fast prime lenses um, in low light. Here's what I, I put this one in because I had the artsy bullet point. Um, you can see the nice background blur. You, it's a lot harder to get this with, um, with uh, like any other lens that's not a prime because primes have that faster aperture and the faster aperture also means uh, that you can throw the background out of focus. And this is also just a really sharp, nice uh, screenshot I got from, from, uh, from this uh, clip I had. And yeah, I just thought this was a good one to show how, how you can get artsy, artistic shots with these fast prime lenses. Okay, so a telephoto is probably the one I use least um, just because I don't find myself in need of it as often, but uh, some of the advantages of it are that they have a good reach, meaning from a practical level, if you can't get close to whatever you're shooting, then uh, you want a telephoto because it will, it's, it'll, you'll be able to zoom in and still get a tight shot uh, and a nice shot of whatever you're shooting, even if it's far away. Uh, they have a shallow depth of field, so you can again get this background blur with them. Um, and they also compress the background and the foreground together. Um, so it makes it look like there's less space between them, which is kind of a cool effect as well. And then you can get tight shots. And shooting tight and making sure there's no extra information in your frame whenever you're filming can really add a lot to your cinematography. If uh, you just cut out, you crop out everything uh, that's extra in your image that's not important. So here's just one example. I, this was at uh, one, 105 millimeters. This was with my 18 to 105. Um, so in, in my case, I have, um, I don't actually use, I have a 55 to 210, but I hardly ever use it because my wide angle also, it's a wide angle zoom lens, so it also zooms to 105 millimeters. Um, so I use it kind of as my wide angle and my zoom lens. And I find myself, whenever I'm using it, I find myself mostly staying at the two extremes. I either am zoomed in all the way to 105 or I'm backed out all the way to 18, um, just because that's how I, I typically shoot with it. But you can see this is a nice tight shot. There's not a lot of extra information. There's really no information considering how blurry the background is, but it's a nice tight shot with an intense face in it. And uh, I think telephotos are really good at doing this. Um, they, they really show intensity, unlike, but uh, you have to get a lot closer with a wide angle or a prime lens to get this same intense look. So ND filters were my special like bonus piece of gear. Um, this is the KNF concept variable ND. Uh, it can, they're basically sunglasses for your camera. Um, I know Ari talked about in his camera basics that you want your, for video, um, for photo, we're, we typically adjust our shutter speed according to the light or sometimes what effect we want if we want a slow shutter speed effect. But for video, you really want to try and keep your shutter speed at just twice your frame rate. So if you're shooting at 24 frames a second, which is what most, uh, uh, which, which was what you'll be shooting at for most things, you want it to be on these mirrorless cameras and these DSLR cameras, you can get it to one over 50th of a second. And so you want it to be you want the shutter, the bottom number of your shutter speed to be twice your, um, or as close as you can get to twice your uh, frames per second. So then that would mean if you're shooting at 24, you want it to be one over 50. You want your shutter speed to be one over 50. If you're shooting at 60 frames a second, you want your shutter speed to be one over 125, I think is with these mirrorless cameras. Uh, you can't get exactly twice, 
but you can get pretty close. And then if you're shooting at 120 frames a second, you want it to be 240, but I think you have to do 250 on like these photo cameras. So ND filters allow you to shoot at proper shutter speeds and uh, your footage will be really taken to the next level. I didn't start using ND filters until this year, really. Um, I just got mine earlier this year and especially this summer, I've been using them on every project and I'm kind of blown away. I feel like I, it almost feels like I got a new camera or something. I have way more dynamic range. It, it feels like my, I find myself, the footage just looks way smoother and cleaner uh, than whenever I didn't use ND filters. Um, so I think they're a really good bonus piece of gear to have. So um, here is without an ND filter. This was before I got one and it's overexposed and it has blown out highlights because I was trying not to crank my shutter speed up too high because it, the footage just gets really jittery and it looks kind of amateur. Um, but it led to this being overexposed and still having a bad shot. <laughs> um, but the this is a proper exposure. I couldn't find a great example of um, of really how like the contrast between light and dark with ND filters. But I thought this one did a good job because this actually you can't tell, but the sun's just right over here, and the sky was really bright this day. Um, but the ND filters made sure made my highlights not be too overexposed, and everything is just a proper exposure. And I was shoot also allowed me to shoot at the proper shutter speed. So now uh, I don't. I'll go ahead and ask. We're kind of moving into a new topic, so I'll go ahead and ask if there's any questions on what I've said so far. I know I talk really fast sometimes when I'm talking about this stuff. Uh, so Angelina says, uh, is there a big difference between the $20 filters and the $150 ones or can we go cheap? Uh, I've actually had other people ask me this before. Um, they, I would su not suggest getting the $20 filters. The one I have, the KNF Concepts one, I have one for every single one of my, these, the KNF Concept. I would write that brand down if you're interested in getting them um, because these things are really good and they're in like the $60 to $80 range depending on what size you're getting. And they go from two to nine stops of uh, neutral uh, of uh, light that it can cut down. So it can go from only cutting down about half the light, which is good if you're, you're in a brighter spot than you want to be, but it's not super bright, to nine stops if you're outside on a super bright day. And these are in the like 60 to $80 range. And I, a lot of people say that online, there's a lot of reviews and saying if you use cheaper ND filters, you'll get some weird like parts in your image, but I've never had any problems with these and I've shot in really bright conditions with them. But yeah, I, I do think spending $150 on the ND filters is a little much like, <laughs> it is just a piece of glass uh, that you put in front of your camera. And I, I would, I, I don't think I would spend $150 on these, but these, uh, these cheaper ones do just fine. Is it possible to just change the frame rate in post if you need to reduce the exposure with no filter present? Uh, so you can't change your frame rate in post. Um, these, these cameras, cameras like this, these DSLR and mirrorless cameras, they shoot, um, mine shoots 24 frames a second, 30 frames a second, uh, 60 frames a second, and 120 frames a second. And you, you can't make, you can't go in your edit, if you shoot at 24 frames a second, which isn't slow motion, uh, you can't make it half speed, which would be 60 frames a second. It'll look really choppy and like you're missing frames. Um, and he says, just change the frame rate in post if you need to reduce the exposure with no filter further. In the case that you don't have a filter, I would, 
a lot of times uh, I, if I don't have a filter and I don't want it to look really jittery, I go to 120 frames a second and um, I'll shoot in like one over a thousandth of a second or something. I really try not to go that much higher than that. But if you don't have a filter, sometimes you have to. Uh, so I would never, never decide your frame rate in post, but it is okay to break the rule that says uh, you shoot, that says to keep your shutter speed um, twice your frame rate. Never go less than twice your frame rate. Never go make your shutter speed less than twice your frame rate, but you can make it more and get away with it. It just won't look the, the best. Um, yeah, so I know that uh, Alicia says, would you recommend in, in the filters for drones? And um, I know that whenever I fly my drone, um, I, I actually broke mine in December, but I taped it back together. And I have been looking at the footage that I have uh, now and just comparing it to the footage I shoot with my camera with ND filters. And to me, uh, my drone footage, I have to shoot at like one over, you know, 1200 frame shutter speed. At, and I'm shooting at 24 frames a second, but jacking my shutter speed way higher than it should be. And it looks really choppy when I cut it together with, uh, with the actual camera, with my actual camera. Uh, so yeah, if you're going to be flying your drone a lot, I would definitely recommend getting the ND filters for drones. Uh, the Polar Pro is a really famous brand that makes them. And uh, I've heard good reviews for the Polar Pro ND filters for drones. All right. All right, I don't think anyone else has anything. So. All right, I'll start my filming techniques section. So I put stabilization is key. No one likes watching shaky footage. I know uh, whenever we film with these little cameras like we do at uh, the UNC Journalism School and um, just a lot of like budget filmmakers do, you can kind of get a jittery effect because holding this is hard, holding it steady is hard. You can get away with it more if you have like a full cinema camera because the weight makes it easier to hold steady. I actually have this metal cage around my camera and to me this, I like the weight that it adds with it because this camera is tiny and I like the weight that it has and it makes it feel better in my hands and it makes it less jerky when I'm trying to shoot handheld. And I just knew it's a, it's a huge problem whenever you shoot with these and your footage looks jittery and it's a really common problem. Um, so I'm going to go over some stuff on how to combat that and make your footage look smoother. So here's some pictures I got of myself uh, doing some of the techniques that I use. Um, so I put how to stabilize and this is the most basic technique. I said um, pull the camera strap tight against your neck. <laughs> Uh, pull, pull the camera strap tight against your neck, uh, and I put that it's not a preferred op it's not per a preferred method if you have other options, but it's good for maximizing mobility. So this is one that I used to do all the time. I would pull my camera strap strap tight, and uh, then you can kind of, you know, make yourself into a tr makeshift tripod, and you can kind of move with your camera, and you'll notice whenever you'll notice the difference whenever you're holding it like this and there's no tension in your camera stra strap, it's way harder to hold steady than if you pull it tight and it feels, it automatically feels way smoother than if you're not. So that's just, uh, that's the easiest, most basic technique. It doesn't require any extra gear but your camera. Um, and it's one I used to use a lot. Um, I have been trying to move away from it as much as possible unless I'm just filming more like casual stuff with my friends or something and I don't want to take my monopod, but for bigger projects and more serious projects that I want to make look professional or maybe use on my portfolio, I try to avoid this as much as possible lately. So um, this is a video monopod and I said, uh, meet your new best friend. This is my preferred method of stabilization. Uh, it allows mobility with tripod-like stabilization. 
So you can see down here that mine have these three, my monopod has these three little feet and it can actually stand by itself and it goes up to six feet tall. And I never like leave it sitting when I have it extended all the way because it would probably fall over. <laughs> but these things are pretty stable and they're built well. If you get a, a decent one, uh, you don't have to spend the most on them to get to get a good quality one. Um, and they also have, you can see a uh, video pan and tilt head. Um, so the difference between a video and a photo tripod head is that video tripod heads are made to move fluidly and you can um, you can actually tilt and pan them without it being super jerky like the photo tripod heads are usually a ball head and you can't really turn those and get a nice shot um, with them and uh, so I love my monopod because you can move around so easily with it and you can just get shot after shot and angle after angle and you can change change your angles really easily and you can just keep your feet extended and just pick it up and move it over. It's not super heavy and uh, you never have to change the height unless you're changing how tall you are. You don't have to, like w whenever you're with a tripod, if you're on a hill or something, you'll have to change the height of like a couple of the legs and leave the other one extended. But you don't have to do that with a monopod. It's super easy to move around and you get tripod-like stabilization with it. It's not going to be 100% like a tripod, but it will be close if you get a decent video monopod. Um, so this is me mixing both techniques for a walking shot. Um, I put the added weight and better grip make for a smoother shot than without the monopod. So this may seem just like it would have the same problem as shooting with just the camera strap, but it actually Shooting with a monopod and walking with the monopod makes uh, makes a lot smoother shot than if you just had um, if you just had the camera in your hands with the strap pulled tight. So I this is something that I do really often if I want a moving shot or a walking shot. I'll pull the camera strap tight against my neck and grip the monopod instead of my camera, and like I was talking about with the cinema cameras, if you have something that weighs more and you can get further out, you can get your hands further away from the sensor of the camera, then you're usually gonna get a smoother shot. And so this looks, in my experience, this looks a lot smoother than if I'm just going handheld. So this is a technique that I do really often. Okay, so I put perfect the ninja walk. Um, knowing how to walk smoothly and walking on the balls of your feet and, you know, heel to the ball of your foot behind your toe is really, really important because um, a lot of people just walk normally whenever they're holding, holding that and the, the shots they get look like super shaky, like up and down and up and down and it just looks bad. So learning how to walk is... Uh, it's one of the physical parts of filmmaking. Um, all this stuff is like physical techniques rather than any of the, than any of the knowledge, but this will improve your shots like drastically. Um, and it'll make it look way smoother and way more professional if you know how to walk than if you just go out and start shooting and, and uh, don't practice this technique. So I put other methods here, uh, tripods, they're great if you can sacrifice mobility. Um, tripods are way harder to move around with and, and they're just kind of cumbersome, try, especially whenever you're filming a fast paced scene and like a documentary and you don't know what's gonna happen. Tri tripods are great for like interview shots and like events and stuff, but I, I would never use one to film like a documentary scene whenever I'm going out in the field. Um, gimbals, gimbals are, uh, are really cool devices, but they're expensive and um, they're also kind of a lot to set up and a lot of people use it as like, it will automatically make their shots great, but they don't actually know how to use the gimbal and so their footage still looks bad. Uh, you still gotta use the other techniques. You still gotta make sure your hands are smooth and you still gotta make sure your walk is smooth. Uh, to make a gimbal shot look good. Another another problem I I have with gimbals is whenever I look at someone's uh, 
film and it's shot like entirely on a gimbal, you can kind of immediately tell. And uh, as filmmakers, we're supposed to kind of, we're supposed to let the audience forget about what we're doing and focus on the story. And I think whenever I watch a film that's entirely shot on a gimbal, I'm thinking about the shot way too much and not what's happening. Um, and I think gimbal shots can have become really overused lately as well. So the other thing I put is sliders. Um, I use a slider sometimes. Uh, <laughs> I never would use it in a documentary. I use it for some detail shots and uh, whenever I'm filming weddings and stuff, but they're a lot to set up and they're not very versatile at all. Um, okay, so does anyone have any questions about uh, this last section? Anyone have any last questions? I, don't, I just can't tell how long it's taking people to type. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and move on, but I'll watch. Oh, so we got someone. Um, is it true that wider shots would automatically be more stable than using the long ones? Uh, yes, that's, I, I would say that's uh, pretty much true 100% of the time. If you're not on a tripod or a monopod or something that's making your shot really smooth, um, wider shots, it's kind of like, uh, it's kind of like um, when it, whenever, whenever you're zoomed in, it's harder to aim. Um, at what whatever you're taking a picture of. And so it's also harder to move with. And it's also any any movement that you make is exaggerated because with a longer telephoto lens, it looks like if you move just a little bit with a telephoto lens, it looks like you moved a lot in the shot. And with a wider shot, if you just move with just a little bit and with a wider shot, then it you basically can't even tell if I just go if I'm just, I have a wide lens and I just go from here to here, you can barely even see that I did anything. But in a telephoto and you're pointing at someone that would move like all the way across their body or, or like um, all the way across whatever you're shooting. So yeah, I would say pretty much all the time it's wider shots are um, more stable. Um, that's a, actually a good point because um, for this technique, I would also, not recommend doing this with anything longer than like a 30 millimeter lens um, because it just gets, it looks too shaky. And um, I would also recommend having, if you're doing, if this is your main method, then get a lens with stabilization in it. Or if your body has, if your camera body has stabilization in it, it will help your footage a lot. Um, okay, so. What do you suggest for stabilization in fast paced settings? And what's your opinion on stabilizing in post? Uh, yeah, so fast paced settings would definitely be the monopod. Um, it's whenever you're first learning to use a monopod, it seems like a lot and like it will get in the way. But after a month of using this, I had it really down and I can move really quickly with it. And now whenever I'm shooting documentaries and I have no idea what's gonna happen, I don't even have to think about how I'm using my monopod or how I'm going to be placing it. Um, next, it's just kind of second nature and I can move around with it really quickly. So that would be my um, main, that would be my suggestion for stabilization in fast paced settings. Um, for what's my opinion on stabilizing in post? Um, so it really depends on your shot. Um, warp stabilizer does a really good job if your shot isn't really shaky. 
Um, but if you have a really shaky shot, it's going to look really bad uh, with warp stabilizer because warp stabilizer will just have all this artifacting and it will it just it won't look good. It also tends to do this like wavy effect um, that looks really bad. And like if you show a filmmaker your shot that was shaky, but you warp stabilized it, they'll be able to tell. And you don't want again you want people to forget about what you're doing whenever you're filming. Um, and so for warp stabilizer, I use whenever I use this technique, I um, I sometimes stabilize in post, and I think it. I I typically it warp stabilizer default whenever you put it on, um, it puts it the smoothness at fifty percent. I typically lower that to like ten percent or less, um, depending on my shot, and that kind of avoids the waviness and the weird things that warp stabilizer can do to your footage. Okay. Anything else? Um, nope, I think we're good. Okay, so next is slow motion. Um, so newer cameras can often shoot at 60 or 120 frames per second. And we've already talked about um, the, the shutter speed rule, making sure it's twice your frame rate, at least twice your frame rate, um, and try not to go over it as, as much as you can. Um, but sometimes if you don't have ND filters, you end up having to anyway. So my camera can shoot at 60 frames a second or 120 frames a second. Um, and that's pretty typical. That's typical of the cameras we use at UNC. And that's typical of most cameras made after, you know, like 2014. Um, it's kind of became a standard that it can shoot in both these frame rates. Um, maybe not in full HD, but it can shoot at those frame rates. Um, so I put to make sure your shutter speed is double your frame rate, never go below. You'll notice if you go below um, double your frame rate, you'll have a lot of weird motion blur and it just won't, won't look good. Um, so this is a tip if you're familiar with my work <laughs> that you might laugh at. I, I put, uh, be careful not to overuse slow motion. I had, um, so whenever I look at my work from the last two years, it wasn't until this year that I feel like I stopped overusing slow motion. I used to use it all the time. Um, and I just thought it was really cool and really dramatic, but Whenever I look at pretty much any of the work I did last year, I look back at it and I'm like, oh, I probably wouldn't have shot that or edited it in slow motion um, if I could go back and redo that. Um, but it's okay. <laughs> so lately I have been, the last like probably four, four films I've made, there's hardly any slow motion in them. There's maybe a few shots, um, but I just find having it at normal, normal speed has has made it feel a lot more real um and sometimes it's good if you want like a dream like um a dream like uh, quality to your work or something or to whatever piece you're working on um but yeah just be careful not to overuse it um it should be used to complement your film not not feel like a gimmick um so here is an example of one of my films that definitely overused slow motion. Um, I wanted, I just wanted to play this. I know it's not going to be smooth um, on Zoom, but I thought I had so, a couple of cool shots in here that are in slow motion. And I think the two shots I have, I think while a lot of the slow motion is overused in this film, I think the two shots I included here are, uh, or there's three shots, but uh, the first two especially, I think they're a really good use of slow motion, and I think they're they're good for doing what slow motion, or they, they capture what slow motion is actually good for, and I think it adds to the scene instead of detracts from it.
Yeah, so I just thought these first two shots were really cool. Like, I don't think this would have been nearly as dramatic if I, especially this shot right here, wouldn't have been as dramatic if it wasn't in slow motion. Yeah, I thought that shot did a good job of capturing what slow motion is actually good for. And he also, it also kind of helps the story because he says in, in that shot, he says, this must be what it feels like to fly. I'm having some PowerPoint problems. He says in the shot, this must be what it feels like to fly. And I think the slow motion really adds uh, to that, that part and it kind of punctuates that line a little bit for some reason. Hold on. There we go. All right, we'll keep going. Um, so uh, scene, scene building and um, shooting a sequence. Emily, I think there's someone in the waiting room. Um, but we'll move on to, uh, well, does anyone have any questions about uh, slow motion first? All right, I'm gonna go ahead and move on. I'll keep an eye on the chat though, um, to see. So, um, a couple important things about uh, scene building and shooting for a sequence is to learn to edit in your head while you shoot. And this this might sound a little weird, but um, editing your near head is super important. So you don't get to your edit and like not have enough footage or not have the right footage, not have all the footage you need. Um, so what I mean by edit in your head is uh, think about whenever you're in this situation and whenever you're shooting, okay, I'm gonna need, I'm gonna need a wide, medium, close to make this a full scene. I'm gonna need, whenever I'm editing, I'm gonna want some something to show context. I'm gonna want a medium shot of what's happening and then a close up shot to add some drama to the scene or uh, to just uh, make it more interesting. And so I, as I'm shooting, whenever I'm shooting video, I'm constantly thinking about what I'm going to need whenever I edit. Um, and that's, that's super important. You're going to think yourself, if you learn to do this well, uh, you're going to think yourself whenever you start getting into your edit. So I put wide, medium, close. This is pretty much the, um, the, the standard for movies and documentaries um, and TV too. They do a wide shot, a medium, and a close shot. And sometimes it's not in that order, um, but always try to get that in every situation you enter whenever you're filming. And I think it'll help you uh, sequence and it'll help you in your edit. It'll show context and make sure you're just capturing everything you need. Um, so sequencing multiple shots to complete one action takes your scene to the next level. This means, um, like if someone is completing one movement, this is this is a lot easier if you have two shooters. But if someone is completing one movement, like I, I make sure to have two shooters whenever I'm filming my weddings. And like if if the groom is twirling the bride or something in the first dance, uh, then I can I can kind of cut you know halfway in between that move uh, to a wider shot or a close up shot, and it'll make it look like one one fluid movement, but there's a cut in between them that's almost seamless. It just makes it, it just, it makes your scene look way more professional and it, um, it really adds a lot to your, to your footage. Um, so I put humans often repeat actions, learn to predict what they might be doing um, next. So whenever, I'm sure if you do uh, photography, 
you think about this as well, um, especially if they're doing something procedural, procedure, procedural, <laughs> sorry, and, um, uh, and like, the, it's repetitive, like they'll do the same thing over and over again, and you can get multiple different angles of that same, same movement. Um, and then you can cut those together, even if it's not the same movement and you're like, you're only shooting by yourself. Um, you can still cut it together and edit if the movements are similar and make it look like one smooth uh, sequence. And I'll show you an example of that in a second. Um, so it, it doesn't have to be the same exact action for your film to make it for you to make it to film like it is. Uh, and that's what I was saying. You can get different angles of similar actions and cut them together and they'll often look really smooth. Um, so this is, this is a film I did with uh, the ultra talented Alicia Carter, who is in the chat here today. And um, so this is just a scene we did. This was a little bit easier because we had two of us shooting uh, this uh, scene, but this is again, one of those repetitive actions, we kind of knew what he was going to do over and over again. So we had a lot of opportunities to film it over and over again and get it from different angles. And I know this isn't going to look smooth, but I can kind of go through shot by shot and go through what we were thinking and how we were shooting for the edit. So I thought this was a really good example of this um, because, because of the sequencing here. And me and Alicia were separated during this filming. Like we weren't right next to each other filming the same stuff. Um, we'd kind of trade spots and, uh, um, and we would uh, just, we, we weren't filming the exact same action every time, but the shots we got could make it look like we were. So this first one is kind of interesting because he, you see him chop uh, the cacao off the tree and then he catches it in the next shot. That wasn't actually the same cacao pod that he chopped. Alicia had got a close up of him chopping the cacao and I got this shot of a completely different cacao and we sequenced it together um, to get that um, really nice sequence to make it look It looks like one, the same movement. And then you'll notice uh, he'll turn around here. And I was actually, I actually got both the, this shot and the next shot and he turns around. Um, so as he turns and faces the right side of the frame, we cut it together with this other shot and see, I got this shot too. So it wasn't the same time that he turned there, but we, but we sequenced it together with this other shot where he turns and then starts walking the way he faced. And so this is a, this is a really nicely sequenced. And we have him putting the cacao pods. We have him putting the cacao pods in the wheelbarrow and then moving the wheelbarrow over to his family. And then here's a good example of wide, medium, close and just making sure um, we got everything, we got all the shots we needed. So here's the Y, the medium shot, one of them, and then, and then there's a close up. Um, so I got a question and it says, I only have one camera, but I have a partner that would work with me on projects. Would the fact that our cameras are different brands negatively affect the editing or general workflow of the film? He shoots Canon and I shoot Nikon, by the way. Um, so I've only ever, I've never shot uh, Sony to Nikon, but I've shot Canon to Sony a lot. And um, I shoot with Sony cameras, but sometimes I'll, I'll use Canon as a second camera if I can get one from the J school or for someone that I'm with is shooting with a Canon camera. And I've noticed, I actually made my own preset for, um, for whenever I go into editing. Um, 
I've noticed that it's it's not that hard to match the colors between Canon and Sony. A lot of people say, you know, there's a lot of arguments online about how they have different color science, but in my experience, you can do it pretty easily. I will say, um, shooting between brands, you will notice the cameras just have different, the cameras have different images, but it's possible to match them. Uh, the main problem I find with Sony and Canon is that um, Sony, the Canon colors tend to look better, but Sony is much sharper and the colors I can actually improve on, um, but the sharpness I can't. So you can, depending on your shot, you can sometimes tell, um, but I wouldn't be afraid of it. It's better than not having the second camera or the second shooter. Um, so I, I mean, I, I use Canon to Sony all the time. Person, you know, icon, icon is easy. Yeah, yeah, different camera brands, they have different looks, but you can, it's it's always best to try and use the same brand if you if you, it's possible. But again, you can work with what you have. So here, um, and I don't know how laggy the scene was that I played, but I wanted to show just like the most basic sequence from the same film. Um, this is like I said, it's a super basic sequence, um, and it's it's a really easy sequence to do. Like this could be easily someone's first like successful sequence. Is we have him. This is a screenshot of the first shot in the scene, and we have him about to put his uh, scuba diving shoes on on for his wetsuit and uh and then it cuts to a close-up of him pulling them pull, putting the shoes on and then it cuts to another close-up of his face and whenever you watch these three together they work super seamlessly like you can't even tell because he'll he eventually in the shot he moves his hands back down and then even though his shoe wasn't on his shoes on here but it still looks super seamless whenever you're watching it and in a documentary you're not going to be able to do everything perfect because you're filming what's happening in front of you. You don't have any control over the scene or what's happening. And then we just cut to a close up of his face. Um, There's a good, you know, wide, medium, close. It's kind of a wide, medium, medium, um, but it's a really easy sequence to do. And you can do something like this your first try. So scene building and editing in your head. Um, I like this scene. This is also a film uh, that I worked on with Alicia Carter. And I just like this scene because it showed uh, kind of my thought process. Alicia wasn't actually here uh, this day. So um, I was, I was by myself, but so, so that made, um, that made editing my head especially important because we couldn't, we couldn't sequence uh, the same exact actions together. Like she couldn't get cutaways while I was filming something else. Um, but I'll show you what we did as I go through it. So I just thought this was a really nice scene and uh, I'll show you why I picked it for this. Um, can I not do that? I'll show you why I picked it for this. So we first go through and here's an establishing shot, like I said, with the wide angle. I just got a shot of the building. Um, I cut to a close up of just to provide more context. And this is the part that I picked this scene for. Um, so whenever I was shooting this, I know I was gonna need a complete statement with him to work together for the audio, um, uh, just cause I need that audio. So I made sure to get a really long shot of him. I was filming him for probably like four minutes straight. And then I picked this out whenever we were editing. Um, 
and uh, yeah, a lot of my camp, I was on him for a long time and I got this whole statement from him. Whoops, there's a little, I got this whole statement from him um, and and then uh, throughout the time I was there, um, I knew I had that statement from him and I knew I had something good from him because I was listening and editing in my head, like I said. And then I was able to get these cutaway shots of other people in the room. And it makes it look like it, it, look like it was happening at the same time that he was talking, but that's just the magic of editing because I got shots of them nodding and cut away shots of the other people in the room uh, looking like they were listening to him. And, and they were, but I couldn't, I couldn't get both at once because I was the only one in the room. Um, and so that, I thought this was a good example of editing my head. I had to think about how I was going to make this scene work in the final edit. And then I just got a scene of her uh, walking out the building. This is another tip. Uh, people walking out and in to doorways is actually, <laughs> it's a really simple shot, but it works so well in transition because uh, this then goes into another scene. Um, yeah, so people walking in and out of doorways is always a good thing to get. Um, so lastly, I have some cinematography tips. Um, I put uh, as my first one, be creative. Uh, photos can look great as standalone images, so think of video the same way. Um, I think a lot of people, whenever they're first starting video, uh, don't really uh, think that creatively about their cinematography. I think they think the creativity happens after in the editing stage, um, but I don't think that's true. I think cinematography can be really beautiful too, and it can, uh, not all it, not every shot you do is going to be able to stand alone because you know video is different because it is about editing as well but i think you can make your your shots look really nice um and just think about them like you're thinking about photos um make sure you get everything you need and don't just focus on making everything pretty because you will need certain stuff um but yeah so in my hearst competition one of the judges said uh you know as you're filming this, we had to film ourselves, so it was really hard. Um, but they were like, make sure your photos, you're not gonna be able to use camera movement because you're alone and you're filming yourself. So make sure your um, video can stand, each clip you put in your film can stand alone as a photo. Um, so, and then I put details, lots of details. Um, in video, details look really cool because a small movement can look really big if you're really close on it. And, you know, if something's, you can kind of imagine something moving all the way across your screen, that's normally small, but it makes it look really big because, you know, a screen is bigger, you watch it on something bigger. Um, and they can be great transitions between scenes. You'll thank yourself for shooting these when you start editing. Uh, I know Alicia and I were really thankful we got a lot of details for our Belize video um, that we were able to use in transition. Um, and then I just have as a bonus, uh, my favorite lighting technique is backlighting. Um, this is, I just put a few examples of like nice uh, screen grabs that I got out of a few of my films. Um, see this I thought could be a standalone image. Uh, you know, it's obviously not perfect. There's some power lines and stuff, but it is a nice, a nice shot. Here's one from uh, that, that Hearst video I made about um, I had to film myself uh, because it was about COVID-19 and what we were doing during isolation. And uh, I thought this was just a creative little shot that I made um, looking out my window. I talked about, and it was also thematic. It helps thematically because I talked about how I was um, an outdoorsy person that was forced to stay inside now because all the areas around me, all the recreation areas around me were closing. Um, here, here's another detail example of how it can just look really cool. And this looks really cool with the dripping um, in the actual video of it. So here's details in transition. I'll just play this little clip.
So I just picked this because it shows we we shot two little detail shots, one of the snail and one of the wave. And uh, we were able to go from the night before where he was talking uh, to the morning after he was talking, uh, just with two little detail shots to transition us. Yeah, it's okay if you can't hear um, the audio. It's not super important. Uh, so my bonus tip is backlighting. Here's again the video for, that I made ab about myself in isolation. Um, and I, I love backlighting. This is just my opinion. I, I love the way it looks and I think it adds, you know, you can really see the shapes whenever you would do backlighting. Here's an interview shot and you, you see the lighting. Backlighting is, I, I didn't really say, but uh, if the name doesn't make it obvious, it's uh, it's light coming from behind the subject, like the opposite side that the camera's on. And I just like, you can see this highlight across her face and uh, I just like the way it looks. Um, I don't think that one, I'll, I won't play that one since we're running low on time. Um, so my final tips is hold your shots. I find myself holding them at least 10 to 15 seconds um, per clip. I, a lot of people, whenever they first start filming, will film like two second clips at a time and then they get to the edit and it is so hard to use it because out of those two seconds, maybe a quarter second will be usable. Out of every 20 second clip I take, maybe five seconds will be usable. And uh, So make sure you hold your shots long enough and uh, don't try to get too rushed or get ahead of yourself. Um, because it'll be more important whenever you edit than making sure you get the next angle. Uh, it'll be more important that you have enough to work with per clip. Um, so practice these tex techniques that um, I'm talking specifically about the uh, steady walking and the uh, using your monopod to film scenes. Um, they take a long time to learn and uh, they, they'll make your footage a lot better if you learn them properly but film a lot even if it's not an actual documentary or like a full-length project. I film random stuff with my friends all the time. Um, so yeah, I, do, I go camping a lot and I ride my bike a lot and uh, I just go, I, I just always take my camera and we'll just film random clips even if I don't plan on doing anything with them. Uh, it's fun for me and I just, it helps me practice too. Watch and analyze a lot of good movies and documentaries. Um, you will start to understand the filmmaker's thought process and see what it works. Uh, once you get like better at filmmaking, it'll kind of <laughs> ruin movies for you because, well not ruin them for you, but whenever you watch a movie, you'll constantly be thinking about what the filmmaker is doing. And like, I basically can't watch a movie without analyzing it in my head, analyzing the cinematography and, uh, and sometimes the story as well. Um, so you'll you'll start to notice like what they're doing with the story, how the shots are moving the story forward, and what kind of cinematography is effective for them. And uh, uh, we're running out of time. Um, I'll just play this last. This is kind of just. Yeah, and I think I, I think I put that in there just because it was some cool shots and nice cinematography, but it was also backlighting. Um, a lot of those, the sun was coming in from behind him and it had a nice flare and it looked really cool. And uh, so I already have one question, but uh, be typing your questions if you have any final questions. So I got... Uh, do you have any tips or techniques for hiding cameras and cameramen when shooting a scene with more than one camera and also sh shooting one of these mirror shots? Um, so yeah, whenever, uh, <laughs> when you have to, 
it, it helps a lot to have experience with whoever you're second shooting with. Um, I would always, if you're just starting out and you've never shot with them before, just try and stay on the same side of the subject or, or whoever you're filming with or whatever you're filming uh, to make sure they're, 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 you're both out of the way of each other's shots. Um, and it's honestly more effective anyway. If you keep switching between one side of the subject and the other side, it'll get really confusing when the audience is watching it anyway. Uh, there's something called the 180 degree rule and um, uh, Angelina actually has a question about that, so I'll tell you about that in a second. But um, so yeah, so it'll just get really confusing if you're constantly switching sides and at a point where they could get in the way anyway. Um, but yeah, it's just practice. Uh, I would recommend shooting with the person before you go out and shoot in the field um, and just make sure you, you know how you each of you work. Um, I would also recommend tips for shooting with two people is to use two different lenses. One use a wide lens and one use a more zoomed in lens. Um, and that way you'll be able to sequence stuff more effectively. Uh, there is a rule in filmmaking, I forget. I forget what it's called, but I think it's like, don't cut two shots together that are at the same focal length um, that are shot from more than or less than 45 degrees. So it'd be weird if you cut a wide shot with a wide shot that was just like a little bit to the side of the last shot, um, if that makes any sense. <laughs> that, that sounds super confusing, but it just works a lot better if one of you is zoomed in and one of you is wide and then you can sequence those two shots together and it actually looked good. Um, how seriously do you take the 180 degree rule, uh, especially in documentary filmmaking? Uh, so yeah, I should have actually put something in here about the 180 degree rule. The 180 degree rule is, this is really hard to show without a diagram or something, but it's basically, there's an imaginary line across your scene and you don't want to move if you're filming. Oh, this is so hard to show. But if you're you have if you start with a shot on one side of the line, you don't want to move across the line and shoot back the other way. Um, man, I wish I could. <laughs> I wish I had a diagram or something. It would make it a lot easier. But I'm assuming Angelina, you know what it is since uh, since you asked me about it. <laughs> but yeah, I try and keep that in mind. In documentary filmmaking, it's a little bit harder um, because you don't have control over your scene or where, where they're gonna move. Okay, cool, yeah. That, Emily just sent a link with a diagram. Uh, that'll do a lot better job of explaining it than me. Uh, so yeah, I always keep the 180 degree rule in mind, um, but in documentary filmmaking, you're not gonna have complete control, so you're not gonna be able to do it all the time. Um, but I do try and shoot with it in mind. And then another tip for that would be get good establishing shots, because if you have a really nice establishing shot that shows the location of everything you're filming in your scene, and you get a nice wide shot of all of it, then you'll actually be able to get away with breaking the 180 degree rule. And, uh, and it won't be too distracting for the audience. All right, and I'll wait on any more questions or on Emily, I don't know. <laughs> I went a little over time, sorry about that. I'm gonna read what Alicia said uh, <laughs> a few minutes ago. She said, remind yourself wide, medium, tight, and then get like 10 plus more details each scene you shoot. Um, terrible to be editing and wish you had more details because now your transitions aren't working. That's like details, details, details. Like it's so important. They work, they're, they're so useful whenever um, you're in editing and get like some atmospheric stuff as well. So I got another question. In documentaries, which is more effective, a time lapse or a B-roll sequence, and when do I use which? Uh, sorry if the question isn't clear. Yeah, I get what you're saying. Um, typically, so you can shoot uh, time lapses 
and use the, I, I would say use time lapse, lapses and transition and when they make sense, but B-roll sequences are what drives your film. Um, the narr you can't put narrative from an interview over, over your time lapse uh, um, and just rely on the time lapse. Uh, B-roll sequences I think are way more effective whenever uh, you do documentaries um, and you say, when do I use which? I would say, like I said, use time lapses to show time passing or um, maybe if someone's talking about time passing, you can use a time lapse and it can look, can look cool and actually make sense or use them in transition. Um, I would use B-roll sequences to cover most of your narrative. So as we're wrapping up and we'll let, um, if you have any questions, you can type them out real fast. Um, I'll just let everyone know our next session is Friday at 7 p.m. And Jeremiah will be teaching about intro to video editing. So learn about how to manage your hard drive and files and get an introduction to Adobe Premiere. Um, also, we ask that you please give us feedback about how we're doing with these with this workshop series. It's our first one virtually, so let us know what we're doing well, how we can improve in the future when we do more. Um, and follow us. Hana runs all of our social media accounts so beautifully, so follow us um, on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Also, you can find Lucas at Lucas Pruitt Media, if I'll you want to follow him. <laughs> yeah, I just sent my Instagram in the chat, just a little plug, <laughs> if you want to follow me.